Welcome back viewers our first guest today has been LinkedIn's number one career coach among the global pool of almost 1000 peers he has worked with professionals in the silicon valley and around the world helping reinvention to get their dream jobs or vocations Dilip thank you so much for joining us today thank I'm you. excited maybe at the end of the show I'm going to find a job for myself <laughs> I thought you already have one oh, I have a busy job but maybe one more <laughs> Okay sure Now uh, we can't uh, Hell, but ask you uh, the current situation. Job build didn't pass, or maybe it was never supposed to pass. Educate me and tell me what it is supposed to mean to common people like us. I mean, I don't really understand all this. I think I think that's a very good question. This just happened so recent that I think we need to spend a minute or two on that. I think the way the bill was structured politically, it was what I call a DBA bill, dead before arrival. Mm -hmm. because they just did not have enough support in the senate and as you know it, it didn't pass in the senate but i think people focus on the wrong things because what i tell people is forget you know there are millions unemployed and 10% unemployment rate or whatever it is how many jobs do you really need right you need one job exactly and there is one for you if you know how to look for one and and not just get into what i call the traditional job search market because the job market shifted almost 10 years ago in 2000 when the tsunami hit the valley and and the economy of this country and yet if you look at how people go about looking for jobs they haven't changed a thing they make the same resumes the same way they send them out the same way and they sit by the phone waiting for the right, phone to ring right. and 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 regardless of this job bill i think those who are in our kind of work don't need to worry that much about what happened to the bill as much as what they can do to get the one job that they need and right. there is one for them i think there is a psychological thing that when you know there are no jobs unemployment right. is rising then you have this fear and you right. get drained in that right. and you are not putting that much effort in really finding the right job for i you. think and people that maybe people. that's right maybe people are giving up before even trying they have this you know fear that surrounds them to say you know it's so bad how can i get a job what's different about me and part of my practice is is to show everybody is different enough that if they can tap into it they have a very different access to the job market and and most people once they see what it is how they can do it they get it but until they get to the point they think they're like everybody else and that's part of the problem this fear creates so there's a technique in actually trying to find the right, right job uh, on the note of unemployment i do want to mention that we say about what 9.5% yeah, 10% 9% so 9% right uh if you go to countries like india i mean they don't even have an unemployment rate over right. there but the job market is thriving booming right. I look at those markets right. where you don't really look at both people working one right. person is making enough money the other person is taking care of the family so we don't factor all of those when we are looking at the unemployment rate here in the US because we assume both the people are supposed to work right right, right. so so dilip how should then one approach their whole process of job hunting i mean i know you refer to the sending out the resumes but do you still go to job sites send right. out to recruiters right. what what is the best approach right. uh to to address this right. situation. Right. A, a whole variety of things you need to do differently. First of all, you know, starting with the resume. One of my pet peeves is people write in their resumes what they have done. And I say go from what you have done to who you are, and people don't know how to do that. So how do you go from what you've done, you know, I increased sales, I hired more people and and they write bullets like that. Well, as a manager, you're supposed to do that. Right. If you don't do that, you would get fired, mm -hmm. right? But if you tell a story around how you did what you did in difficult times, now you're talking more about yourself than mm -hmm. what you've done, right? right? right. And right. once you're able to tell a story about how you do what you do, you, your whole message has a very different energy and then then you stand away from the crowd. And It's, I also think it becomes more real then because when you're telling the story right. that reflects who you are as right. a person as opposed to what you did in your job Correct. because you can you know write anything you want as right. to what you did. Right. And and Good people point. don't understand the difference between tasks, responsibilities and accomplishments. If you look at the bullets to write on the resume, they are either tasks or responsibilities that doesn't have the soul I call it of right. who they are. Mm -hmm. And if you identify how to capture that concisely and write a story in about two or three lines 
all of a sudden the resume has a very different energy to it. Right, right. right. So, and, and, that's and that may up. be a good uh, way to get yourself noticed because right. I believe for the same job there are so many resumes today right. that to get noticed you have to do it differently and I think that's a very good point you brought up. Well, that's just one aspect of it. You know, the other aspect is how you market yourself, how do you network, how do you access jobs that don't even exist because there is so much turmoil in this economy right now, especially large companies, and this is what I tell my clients to do, is go after a company that you want to work at and find out their pain points that may not be apparent unless you do some research. And that research is not that hard to do. And once you identify that, you know, they really are suffering from poor customer satisfaction, for example, find out two or three things that you could do as, for example, a salesperson or a marketing person or a customer support person. Let's say that I understand your customer satisfaction is eroding. Here's three things I can do to help you show it up. Solving a problem. Right. That an age-old success. Exactly. If you exactly. want to solve, a, if you can solve a problem through right. expertise, right. I think companies will right. jump on you. Right. And that also applies to people inside the company. And you know, a lot of there is a lot of nervousness at companies right now because am I going to get laid off? You know. Right. And and people are always wondering, you know, am I next online? And I tell uh, my clients come to me, I said, find something in your company that nobody's doing and claim it and volunteer for right. it. And once you kind of do that, then you are on a, on a mission right. and they're <laughs> so, less likely to be fired. Yeah. Dilip, I mean, that, that's great for maybe someone who knows precisely what they want to do, but there are also a lot of people who maybe have a current job or holding on to it, but um, are sort of in a career stagnation mode, and then there is this uncertainty in the employment market. Right. What, what is the best way for them to find that fulfillment in their careers or yeah, to find the next I opportunity? I think that's a great point. I think that's a great point. And this is what happens. It becomes kind of a vicious circle, a vicious cycle, that you get nervous and you become more in jeopardy because mm -hmm people see you you look afraid and, and all of a sudden you expose yourself to more risk and what I tell people is is be vigilant about what's in your job that's around that you can do by volunteering for something that needs to be done that will show you as somebody different than just taking orders most people just take orders and, and do right, a reasonable right. job and so rather than being afraid because of the economy and because of what's happening I think if you look around and if you identify opportunities within your own company and approach somebody who is able to make a decision and say, and I do this so much in my practice that I know it works in this economy, I'm not making this up. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you have a very different purpose in your company. So are you, are you referring to what would be like informational interviews within your current company to find out what are the other opportunities? Good point. I'm, and I'm going a step further. Okay. I'm not saying just informational interview. I don't know, you are in the company, so you know what's not happening that is right or something that should happen better than it does, right? And so you do some research around talking to different people cross-functionally and go to somebody yeah. one or two levels above and say, you know, I'm seeing this pattern in our company that we can improve this. Right, right. These are the three Again, things. Again, goes back to the point of right. solving a problem right. and be proactive right. in identifying the problem and then finding a solution. And then, you know, that helps you, um, you know, grow in your own company. Right. And you become uh, very valuable in your company. So it applies both ways. And this is what I mean by the shift in the job market. Mm -hmm. Rather than just you know, blindly applying for a job that's open and available, because mm -hmm. everybody applies for it. So what's special about mm -hmm. you? So I'm saying the following things. Make your resume go from what you've done to who you are. Your leadership stories in the resume. Number two, try to find opportunities that are not obvious to most people, mm -hmm. especially companies that are hiring. Right. Number three, if you are in a company, if you have a job, and if you feel like, gosh, you know, I may be at risk here, in risk or not, go identify something you can do within your company. Go approach somebody, say, you know, this is what we need to do, not to make me a better person in terms of promotion or whatever, but to satisfy our customer. Right. This is what and I would to like grow to grow the company. Right. Now, I have a question uh, around what I see in my friend circle. A lot of my friends are a job, are looking for one. Uh, they often don't want to accept a job with a lesser pay or a lesser designation or doing a different thing that right. uh, they have done in the past. Right. Uh, well, the market is not the same, so right. you're not going to find the same job that you did two years or three years back. Right. <laughs> but is it the right thing to do to wait for the right job and the right pay and all of that or jump on something that is kind of optimum today? 
I think that's a great point. This is what I think happens when people get into the mindset that the economy is bad and I should take what I get, especially I'm being out for six months, a year or something. I think that fear is well-founded, but it's misguided. And the reason it's misguided is people focus on salary and title. This is our hang-up that we have. And I tell my clients, don't focus on salary and title. Focus on value and responsibility. Mm -hmm. Completely different calculus. Right. And when you do that, when you show the value you create, now what you get compensated for is driven by the value you deliver. Right. And so even in a job that's well-defined, try to identify a value that only you can create. And say, and I just did this with a client, a fairly senior client, who joined a major bank just this week. And he was given 20% less than what he actually deserved. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, you make 20% less here. That's what we're going to give you. I said, wrong. Look at the value I'm going to create in your company. And that value is very different from the value I create over there. And here is how I create this value. And he not only got 20%, he got more than that. Right, right. right? So it, it, it's sort of as cliche as it sounded. It's, you, are you saying find what you love and the money will follow after that? Don't let the salary be the driving factor. I think that's well said, but I would like to add something to that. Uh -huh. Be so confident about the value you create that when you have this passion and when you get that direction, say what you create in that position as value and don't be afraid to say that this is the value I create and I expect to be compensated for that value. Mm -hmm. Unless you say that, they're not going to give it to you. They're not going to go to this guy. Mm -hmm. But once we kind of showed them how this position creates greater value for them compared to where he was, mm -hmm. they said, you're right. We, well, I we totally that. understand yeah. that point. I don't make any money out of the show, but I create a value, Correct. right? Correct. And I'm passionate about what I do, so right. a money will follow. But and that's, right. that's the belief right. and the faith that I sustain, right. I want to put the show together right. every week after week without making money, but I'm so excited right. about it. And the same, same thing applies to titles, the salary and the title hang up we yeah. have. Uh -huh. So people say, you know, I have to be a senior director. I said, don't go there. Let's just look at the open job and tell them the, the responsibilities you want in that position. And once you lay out those responsibilities, they will say, well, the only person who can do that has to be a senior director. So you kind of go through it to the back door rather than saying, I want a senior director job. You see what I'm saying? Right, and this right. works so well when you focus on the value and responsibility right, 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 that, right. Uh, that people are amazed how well that works. Right. Now, I totally understand what <laughs> makes him the number one career coach because I'd love to sit and talk to you. I think we both would love to sit and talk to you forever. Absolutely. But you're cute for time. So sorry about that. We'll bring you again one more time. Thanks for having me. Thank you so Thank much, Dilip. Bye-bye.